Uh, yeah, first, thanks to everyone who uh, already did such amazing presentations today. I think that we are in this amazing position as, um, as UX designers to actually bring bring value to patients and to to improve um, to improve improve uh, the life of a lot of people so we can have a really awesome big impact by designing those contexts and having an, we can have an even bigger impact when we're faster right and that's the topic of my talk today the faster we are the more we can help real humans to get well sooner yeah so um, since this getting faster is such a topic, um, there are a lot of those agile design frameworks, right? Um, maybe design thinking, uh, lean your X, uh, the four D's, four I's, whatever. Um, so many, so many great frameworks, but those frameworks actually work most or mostly are applicable on design management level. So. <clears throat> as us people working as UX designers on the project ground, um, those frameworks don't really help a lot, right? So they basically all um, show those awesome advantages of iterations. Um, they all have agile design pro, uh, process frameworks. So really uh, design uh, uh, like flow charts and stuff, the way how, how the process should work and um, generic methodology books, which is uh, really great, but um, doesn't really answer the very specific issues uh, UX designers have then in those, in those uh, projects on the project ground. From my point of view and my experience from working in that field for the last years, the three, the th the three biggest, um, the three biggest points for UX designers on the project ground in agile projects are actually decision-making, right? That's the first one, because we can make all our, all the de decisions ourselves. Now there's not so much stuff um, decided in a SOW or something like that before. So decisions are way more up to the designers. Second thing is the work routine, which is in my, uh, from my perspective, um, really different from those what from this waterfall world to the agile UX world, and the third thing is finding the right finding the right focus, um, and finding the right focus um, because as well like it's not really it's not really not really defined before in the project brief what we have to do, but there's rather a goal that we need to reach, and we need to find the focus in the project um, to focus on something that brings most value so that we can reach that goal. So I want to start with that focus now. Focus. Um, as I said, there's a lot of different stuff we could theoretically focus on in projects. And out of, out of all those things, finding, finding the right one is definitely hard. Um, so I want to start by telling you a story where we um, where we built a, a part of the product and eventually didn't find this focus right away so in theory we wanted to build this awesome mvp um, which would answer for uh, for researchers at our company uh, the uh, the answer which clinic sites close to the patient are best suited to treat a specific icd subcode not not only this one but just to make it specific in the example so um, which sites close to the patients are best suited to, to treat, for example, ICD SIP code um, I42.0, um, which is a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so then uh, we went on and went through this agile, went through an agile design process. We first uh, did research, framed the problem, experimented, did prototypes, iterative, of course, did a lot of user testing. And there it was, the awesome, the awesome MVP in theory, the clinics finder. Um, we built that, uh, we built the tool with the best intentions, um, and it was it passed user testing, but still 
it was somehow in usage absolutely unloved. Like it really didn't bring the value we thought it would bring. Um, although it would like be a breakthrough research tool, like in theory. So why wasn't it loved by the researchers in our company? Um, well, uh, we to find that out, um, we reflected a lot and we iterated on the tool. But what was actually quite a breakthrough and what's helping now, what's helping to us really now to find the right focus, is to look at the pace layers of digital products. So we have, um, from our perspective and our product, we see six pace layers, which, by the way, not a model by us, but um, already quite a quite traditional model from. Um, yeah, well, I first found that in the in the book um, "Living in Information" from Borja Arango. But anyway, um, those pace layers, uh, those pace layers can really help us to find uh, to find the right focus in a project. So what what we did in the it, it's a um, Different layers, which are, um, which um, which are different, uh, which are differently hard to change. So, for example, the purpose of a product is really hard and slow to change. It's uh, basically what everything is rooted, what all all other layers are rooted in. But the form on the other side, up here, is the easiest and quickest to change. So we had for the clinics finder. The strategic, the strategic decisions. So we acted on that pace layer, and then we modeled the data, and um, so we worked on the structure layer and built a UI, the form layer. Um, as I said, that didn't quite work out. So we looked into, so based on that model, we looked into the other layers, and we actually found that the main challenges were on the governance and culture layers. So then, uh, then when we look deeper in those in those layers, we found that culturally, culturally, the company wasn't quite ready for for a, for a tool which was like that revolutionary. Um, and from a governance level, the entire workflows and stuff were not uh, were were still all based on this old approach and not on the new one. So when we went out and uh, or when we went to our colleagues and mapped together with them the entire research uh, workflow in one of the next iterations um, and learned way more about, about their culture, <clears throat> um, we eventually found out how to, how to change the, the product and how to, how to adapt it in a way that it was actually loved. Um, it, was, it was basically the... the Result of that was to uh, help them on the governance layer, so with the with the process uh, with the processes um, have a, to have a really proper selection to see the selection in a really good way to easily always like when you're in the detail looking at the data um, to f still have a have an overview of what's selected and to actually generate a table. So all their old tools didn't have those features. Um, that's why like before no one thought about it. Um, but only when looking deeper in the governance layer, uh, we discovered what needed to be done. So that was the first, that was the first chapter, uh, finding focus uh, and, and designing those layers. But obviously, for all of those layers to be designed, um, you need a different work routine than you had in the waterfall, than, you, than we had in the waterfall uh, in waterfall projects. So, um, of course, uh, um, of course, uh, pace the form pace layer needs really different needs really different um, needs really different design uh, needs a really different design process than a governance than designing changes on the governance layer, and also the changes on the gov on the, on the on the governance layer had then again effects on the form layer. Um, so we we saw that all those layers actually have effects uh, on on each other and change at a different pace. So when we would have started uh, changing the governance layer in the beginning and focusing on that, and then later on the form layer, um, we would have been way more successful. And that's 
what we're applying now in, in later iterations and on new parts of the product. So um, getting to the work routines for the different for, for the different pace layers for designing them. Um, designing an uh, efficient work routine as a UX person in an agile project is basically, from my perspective, reducing the what the f moments every day. So having, the, having those moments as low as possible is great. For example, you know this when you want to collaborate with someone and then the tool doesn't really allow it, that's a classical moment that needs to go, needs to go out there in order to be faster. <clears throat> Um, that was what just one example. We'll see a lot more during the during the next minutes. Um, so in this in this agile, when you come up with the agile UX routine, or when we came up with that, we realized that there are three main vari variables which depend on each other and can make together make up a great workflow. So the first thing on the top are impactful artifacts. So actually having Actually, not doing building the artifacts which were like which were uh, asked for by other teams or the clients, but really reflecting and thinking about what what's the thing that has that I can have that I can build that I can have the biggest impact with. The second thing is open-minded teamwork. So, not only sticking to your UX silo role, but actually looking on it with a way broader view and then really defining which role everyone in the team has in order to be highly efficient. And the first thing is, uh, the third thing is to uh, have tools that fit the context or to, to choose tools that fit the context. So I wanna talk about those three things now. Um, and I actually want to start with the impactful artifacts. So let's start with that. I think this boils down to, to the question to ask which artifact can unlock the biggest value in the next step. So when we, uh, when we were in a, in a, pre in a iteration of another part of the product, um, there was the, I thought, okay, he, in the, on this, on this point, we could have, uh, we could do high fidelity wireframe prototypes or the time also is enough to do a quick HTML, HTML click through prototype. Um, and then what, what, what we learned in this, in this agile team routine was to assess the impact of the artifact um, that, that could be built. Um, and a good, a good way of thinking about this was to check how many locks can be unlocked with those artifacts. So when we realized that with the quick HTML click, click through proto prototype, so many more questions would be answered. Um, because so many like closed locks, things which were just not answered could be answered with that. We saw that this had, would have the way bigger impact and would build that. And since we are thinking about this in that way, um, the, we're getting faster. But of course, you're not, we're not building those artifacts ourselves, right? Though the one thing we can probably settle on as all your ex designers is that we are not building the product, doing the production code. But um, we are uh, co-creating artifacts which help on the way to, to building the final product. So it's very important in the, in the team to, um, to be clear about who has which role in order to have a, to have a fast and smooth communication. And that's basically what helps there is really open. What we learned help there is really open-minded teamwork. So once I thought I was co-creating the artifact, but um, another part of the team actually thought that I was like collaborating on it. So actually not really forming the thing itself, but rather giving giving like uh, giving input to it, right? So like really big difference. Are you act, are you actually collaborating on it or are you co-creating? I think other typical roles for us designers are uh, facilitation. So are you helping a group to achieve the result or actually supporting or actually supporting the group in achieving, achieving the result from the side? 
yeah so different roles and being clear about the with being clear about who who is in which role um, while creating those impactful artifacts um, helps a lot in getting faster or helps us a lot in getting faster just no view so this playground just transformed into a screen and that's uh, actually on purpose because um, to build those artifacts, you need to have kind of a play playground, right? And um, choosing this playground is especially, especially in an agile context, um, really important, really, really relevant thing because the tools need to, they are really fit the context. And I want to discuss three contexts with you now. The first one is enabling teamwork. <clears throat> so in the enabling teamwork uh, context, there are like many tools which allow or which don't allow collaboration. For example, when you do diagrams in OmniGraffle or like a traditional wireframing, uh, a traditional diagramming tool, you're just, uh, just doing it for yourself and you can do crazy stuff there, but no one can actively and easily collaborate on this digital artifact, so or co-create it with you. Um, so let's have a look at at how that could look, can or how that looks like um, in our agile teams. We have those whimsical documents, those whimsical flows, and the UI there is really simple. So so people from all kinds of roles can actually, and this is even more relevant now in the home office context, can actually collaborate. Um, can actually collaborate uh, on that artifact itself. So they can change, uh, they can change the connections. They can change arrows. They can uh, they can change titles, adapt the adapt the content, and comment on it. And this is great because it allows us to um, to shorten to uh, to shorten the <clears throat> uh, the time that the teamwork really needs um, there. The, se the second thing is, the second context is reducing the brain to sharing time. I really like that, that, that term because brain to sharing time means how long does it need from my thought in my UX brain to actually being able to share, how long do I need to share from there the artifact um, with other people, with colleagues, with uh, users, with whoever. Um, so there are also tools which, uh, so when, when it's about, uh, when it's while creating an impactful artifact, um, it's when it's then about reducing the, the brain to share, the context is reducing the brain to sharing time. Well, there are great tools. I, I think wire, uh, wireframes are a great example for that. When you compare um, doing really detailed wireframes in, in expert tools like Axure, um, it's it's always quite a hassle, or always looks like quite a hassle. But when you go to the iPad and just draw on on tools, draw those wire sketches in tools like Concepts, um, this brain to sharing time goes severely down, and you're able, or we are able to to communicate our ideas as UX designers way faster. So just to give you an, an idea how that looks like, instead of a perfectly then wireframe in, in Azure, we just have a quick wire sketch here and you basically drawing vectors. So you can, you can actually reuse shapes you draw, drew and you can, um, can, can really edit the, edit the sketches super fast and easily. You can also really, you can also in that tool express really well domain model sketches, conceptual model sketches, which extremely helps to quickly communicate ideas or, or like your UX, uh, UX thoughts. And the third, the third context I'd like to talk about is automating repetitive hard work. So we had that uh, already earlier in a, in a talk, I think um, but the data visualization talk was uh, already super interesting in that, in that context. Um, because it's about really looking looking into the data is quite easily. So when it's not about looking at specific at, at specific um, at spe specific patient data like heart rates or like those uh, health 
uh, health information, <clears throat> but rather about um, understanding what people want or what they need. Um, it's often a classic thing to that uh, UX people or research people get a lot of interviews or like the or the descriptions that people uh, wrote, description text that people wrote in in profiles, and then they go through there or feedback text they wrote, and then they go through there and cluster the cluster them, and uh, then you get basically a, a analysis out of this, which which you need to do every time again and again and again. But you can also generate those data insights in R, for example, with um, with text processing in there, and generate things from from a, from big uh, from big text from big files where um, thousands of pa patients express their their problems in in surveys or stuff. Um, just very quickly generate. Uh, generate, uh, for example, word clouds, so insights into those data sets, and that way, um, that way, being that way, UX designer, we UX designers are way can way faster look through data sets, and uh, we don't have to do the manual and hard work every time again. So that was the third context. So when you when you combine those and always or when we combine those and always look for creating impactful artifacts with the right, together with the right people um, when we when we uh, look with people when we create impactful artifacts together with the right people um, and we do this with tools that fit the context we act, we get usually a low brain to sharing time a high automation of work and enabled collaboration and co-creation, and that actually really makes us faster. Yeah, so those were the three, those were the, were the three elements of our Agile UX workflow. But, um, all those but all those things in the workflow are decisions, right? Someone has to decide which is the impactful artifact and which artifact to go for and which tool to use and which people to in to to involved in the agile process and which people not to involve in the in the agile process and that is actually where decision making uh, where this decision making point of my talk comes into play i guess so we uh we learned that decision that decisions which are just not there and that for you waiting we're waiting for them are definitely something which um which takes a lot of time in projects. So, <clears throat> the first thing to get uh, to get this time this this time spent this wa basically waiting for the decisions time down is validating the set setup and being really clear about what the team's role is. When the team is on a playground and no one under really understands what what play what game is being played, well then actually uh, the, that must be that must be clarified before any decisions can be can be made so the, there must be a shared goal and a shared understanding of what what's actually being done um, then when this is done we ux designers can can make decisions in two ways or in a mix of them it's basically about um, about doing conversation or a data-driven decision. When you're doing data uh, uh, conversation-driven decisions, it's about uh, talking talking things through with people and uh, together with them um, coming to coming to a decision. Yeah. But when it's about data-driven decisions, you can actually be way faster because it's not not about aligning things with multiple stakeholders. But when you find clear argument, clear reasoning. Um, that's always great for a fast decision. So, for example, um, where where we did that recently was when we redesigned um, uh, a, a card for looking on looking for like all rounder physicians. Uh, we had a huge data set um, there with uh, text, and we wanted to, or basically with attributes about a physician, and we wanted to look how to visually display that in the interface, and instead of Talking a lot with people like how this should be, how how they how those attributes should be displayed and and what they could be, um, we really looked into the data set and saw okay so most uh, most um, 
most uh, attributes are actually quite short and um, there are a couple which are really which we have which are there really often so this brought us about to the idea to make it filterable and stuff <clears throat> so that made us really way faster with coming up to the design decision to use text for that and um, yeah we also knew okay uh, from a certain character count we would need to ellipse them out because there are a couple which are getting really long and we could basically build a really cool UI there um, just, just from looking at the data, which then people really loved. So research colleagues really loved. Um, so uh, one of the last things is um, the stake and uh, of the decision and uh, the cost for change. So is it a low stake decision? Uh, decision? Well, it just we learned that it just makes sense to take that decision but to get the cost for change as low uh, as low as possible by making the by, by making the effects of the of the decision modular and by consciously thinking about okay we should be able to to change things as cheaply as possible um, while uh, in the beginning there was this risk management talk right right and this is the opposite. So when there, when we have to decide things which have potentially huge consequences, so where the patient is at risk or at uh, as a shadow, our jobs are at risk. Where, well, that's um, that's when it's a high stake decision, which we would, uh, which which you definitely don't just want to take. But getting always when you have to decide something or when you have to wait for a decision, um, being conscious about that really helps. And that brings us to the end, which is uh, learning, which is about learning from decisions. Um, so whatever decisions are taken or not taken, um, the most important thing is to learn together about that um, in team retrospectives and personal reflections. First team retrospectives, we use a method which is called the Lean Retro, uh, where we gather topics, vote on them in a, on a Trello board, and then um, we we'll always discuss those retro topics after after the projects, um, and after five minutes, everyone either gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down. When there are enough thumbs up, well, we continue talking about it. When there are thumbs down, well, then it's ta being taken offline. So that way, we, w however we decide, we always make sure to learn from, always make sure to learn from that. And well, personal decisions, uh, personal reflection, uh, also super important and guess what this talk was for um, as well. Yeah, I think I, I learned, I hope that you, you could take a lot from that, from, from the last minutes and um, I at least could. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. And in the end, I want to say that this all dep always depends on the context. So um, in our team, it really works like everyone brings things in and um, we check if they work, and uh, if they don't work, well, we get this boomerang back, which is a really different from an agency setting where you can just do something, and uh, well, the client then the client then has to deal with the consequences if the client decides something. But in in our position, we get we always get that boomerang back, and um, yeah, that that way we always try and learn and experiment, and I think this mindset is really essential. Um, yeah. So I hope you can apply one or more of, of my learnings about the um, <laughs> about being fast. Um, thank you and.